Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Masterclass, Headspace, and our new sponsor today, Rogue Amoeba. Very excited to have them on. We'll talk about those in a moment. But joining me on this fateful episode, Wes Hillier to talk about the iPad Pro. What's up, Wes? Hey, Steven. Just excited to spend a bunch of money this week. (laughs) You are totally right. So we're going to talk about all those things. Obviously, the Spring Loaded event happened earlier this week. We did a recap episode and tried to get it out as quick as possible. I think I made it in about 70 minutes. And you can listen to that for kind of just a fast rundown of everything the event announced and everything Apple released. But today we're going to go in depth. And Wes, I want to go in reverse chronological order of the event because the iPad Pro is what you and I have talked about for many weeks. Maybe even before we just touch on that, you know, a little meta discussion about the event itself. This has been now maybe what the fifth or sixth virtual event. You had Dub Dub last year. You had the three fall events. You know, they've kind of got it down to a science a little bit. They've kept it to an hour. I think all these virtual events have been a pretty tight hour. Everything extremely well produced, obviously. But what did you just think about the event overall? It was pretty fun. Uh, I believe this is the fifth one. And now we have two events with spy themes. Uh, we got uh, 007, <laughs> yes. right, last time. And this time we got Mission Impossible. So You know, what? it's funny, too. I think when the AirPods Generation 2 were launched, that came with a video of someone running spy-like and tapping for the Hey Siri. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely a spy theme going on. Well, remember when that one p- poor person had to run all the way across Apple Park to give Tim Cook the clicker? <laughs> yes. And, you know, speaking of Tim Cook, he usually has his deal where he'll open the program and he'll close the program, maybe do a little transition in the middle. But this time, Tim Cook, not only did he have kind of two big announcements at the beginning of the event, and I'm talking about the Apple Card and the Apple Podcast thing, which we'll get to in a little bit. But then he also starred in this year's spy thing. And I have to say, I'll be honest, I was not expecting Tim Cook's face Mission Impossible style, like face mask off to uh, the, introduce the iPad Pro. Yeah, that, that was pretty funny. And of course, it's already been memed around the internet. So I, I expect to see that <laughs> yes. Tim Cook face on everything now. Absolutely. And so let's dive into one of the biggest announcements. Going in reverse chronological order. Again, there's chapters in the episode. Listeners, if you want to jump to the product that you're most interested in, you can look at the chapters in your podcast app of choice and jump around. But we are going to talk about the iPad Pro, first of all. Now, of course, I have to mention all the memes of Earth, Wind & Fire. They could not stop the 2021 iPad Pro from coming out, at least in the spring. Even though it is going to be actually available like mid-May, you know, maybe we'll say we were both right. Kind of came out right in the middle. Yeah, I I just knew that there was no way they were going to do this in March. If they had announced it at whatever March, what, 14th, 24th event, it would have been right at a year and apple when was the last time apple really did ipads one year one after the other and i'm not talking about the ipad 4 but like it's it's just very rare especially for ipad pros to get updated on such a regular basis sure i was expecting it in the fall at the latest like this wasn't going to be a 2022 product of course but march just felt too early i expected wwdc just because that once we were out of March, it felt like April was just never going to have an event. So <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to see it now. And uh, that way we can get our money out of our pockets sooner and get, you know, right. get our finances ready because WWDC, <laughs> who knows? Apple could always throw out a little bit more hardware. Yes. We'll find out. What was interesting is so many of the rumors and leaks were accurate in regards to not only the iMac and the other AirTags we'll talk about, but the iPad Pro, it was rumored that the USB-C connector would become Thunderbolt, the mini LED display, but just on the larger side. And of course, the chip upgrade, we didn't know what it was going to be. Many people thought they'd stick with the A-series chip, and that was actually pretty surprising that they just said, we're going to put the M1 chip, the same chip that's in the MacBook Pro, MacBook Air, and Mac Mini, Now the new iMac, that's actually what's going to be be powering the new iPad Pro. So it's it's got the M1. And if you look at the details, you can actually spec up a new iPad Pro to match the specs of any of the M1 Macs that we've had previously. It's the M1 chip. You can now get it up to two terabytes. The one and two terabyte models of the new iPad Pro come with 16 gigabytes of RAM, which I thought was interesting that Apple was actually surfacing the RAM numbers now. They haven't done that historically. And that's exactly what you could get on the other M1 Macs. You can't get more than 16 gigs of RAM. You can't get more than 
two terabytes. And so this iPad Pro, if you spec it out, plus cellular, is actually the most powerful Apple Silicon device, arguably the most powerful in the lineup aside from certain configurations of the Mac Pro. It's pretty amazing. Right. So we can basically spec this thing very similarly to these MacBooks. And weird is uh, before people discussing, oh, well, what's the difference between an iPad Pro and a MacBook? And, you know, looking at the chipsets and the architectures, like it was a really hard compare because they were there. One was Intel. One was Apple's ARM chip. One had uh, different GPUs and all, all this stuff going on. And now they are identical processors, identical storage options. Uh, this one has fast storage, so who knows? We might even have faster storage than what's in the MacBooks, or maybe at least similar storage to what's in the MacBook Pro. I guess we'll have to dig into the details for that. But very comparable specs now. Looking at this iPad Pro, the only difference really is it's a tablet, which touchscreen, Apple Pencil, right. all that, sure. But the operating system, iPad OS. So, and that was the big question. You know, people have been tweeting at both you and myself about now what is going to happen with the software. And this is what I feel like the rest of the story has to be told at WWDC. I tweeted before the weekend, before the event, the story would make sense if Apple said Final Cut Pro, Logic, now on the iPad Pro, which again, you can get the same specs on this iPad Pro as the other M1 Macs that run those pieces of software, Final Cut and Logic. Now they didn't mention anything software-wise basically in pretty much any of the products aside from the Find My Things and the new camera features on the FaceTime camera, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I have to imagine that at WWDC, we're going to see an iPad OS 15, hopefully with some different multitasking and utility options and some pro apps. Now, Apple actually straight up talked about LumaFusion for video editing on the iPad Pro. They showed off Lightroom, Adobe's Lightroom on the iPad Pro. So they have no problem showing off pro apps, but I guess the question is, will they bring their own first party pro apps to the iPad Pro? What do you think? I think it's obvious. Why Why would we have 16 gigs of RAM otherwise? Especially now, like we ha the discussion has to arise again of Xcode. Right. Because out of all of the things and all of the reasons to go out here and spec up a MacBook, what are you really doing it for? I mean, yes, it'll help with video production and stuff. But from what I hear, most of the time, the developers are the ones going out here and getting that big MacBook with 16, now 32 gigs of RAM and, you know, specking it up back when it was the, a uh, 16 gigs of RAM is a limitation for developers and they were complaining about it and whatnot. But for an iPad, from that perspective, just having that uh, development on the go or, or to have the ability to test apps directly on the uh, device that you're developing them for, I think it makes a lot of sense to at least have way more RAM than maybe what the consumer's expecting, because now you're developing the app producing it on the device, distributing it to other iPads, which have much less RAM, because most people, even after this comes out, are still going to have eight gigs, six gigs, or sometimes four gigs of RAM on iPads. So, Right. In addition to the M1 chip, 16 gigs of RAM, the two terabytes of storage, the connector is now a Thunderbolt slash USB 4 connector. So that USB-C port is actually Thunderbolt, meaning you could take advantage of fast data transfer speeds if you have a Thunderbolt SSD or other hard drive. And it also supports 6K displays, which they actually mentioned specifically that the iPad Pro now supports the Pro Display XDR, which is a pretty big deal. A couple of people tweeted at us and said, in the presentation, they used this one image showing someone editing video on the iPad Pro and then a large monitor in the background connected to the iPad Pro with like a preview window on that. Now, you can read into it like maybe hopefully Apple will bring that separate display support in iPad OS 15. You can do that already in some apps on the iPad. Keynote, probably the one that most people would realize. You can do a presentation on an iPad connected to a display and you get presenter display on the iPad and then the actual keynote on that secondary display. But interesting that they would talk about Pro Display XDR, it supports it, but as of right now, you can't do native dual screen support on the iPad Pro. You think that's gonna come? Apple hasn't shied away from showing external monitor support on the iPad before. Their presentations have uh, shown people using iPads connected to monitors, especially back when they first introduced the iPad Pro with USB-C. It's nothing new to see this, and I, I I don't know which application it was. I wasn't paying that much attention to that portion, but it could have been LumaFusion or iMovie. Yeah. I know uh, a lot of these pro apps have full screen external monitor support. 
one I use every day is the Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer. Uh, both of those pop your image that you're working on in full screen on the external monitor with the UI remaining on the iPad. Uh, there's several apps that do this, especially pro apps. And I think Apple wants to push that, yes, you can use an external monitor, but again, this is the USB-C story. If you remember, the iPad Pros came out with USB-C and everyone's like, wow, yes, finally, no more lightning, no more dongles of that regard, possibly new things. But guess what? <laughs> iPad OS hadn't been updated, so this magical new port couldn't do anything. There was no storage support. There was no, right. you couldn't connect a lot of peripherals and stuff yet, but we got the full story at WWDC. And I think this is again going to be the case. iPad OS is due for a huge overhaul. So in addition to that port, 5G cellular connectivity on the iPad Pro, the slightly better cameras, we still have the LiDAR. We're going to talk about the center stage feature in a moment, but one of the big standout features, and this is just on the 12.9 inch display, like the rumors suggested, is the quote, liquid retina XDR display end quote. That's Apple's name for the display on the 12.9 inch iPad only, but it is that mini LED technology that we have been talking about. Apple stated 10,000 mini LEDs make up the display of the new iPad Pro, 2,500 local dimming zones. Basically, this display is going to look great. Now, we just need to actually see it and look at it and compare with other monitors to see how good it is. But Knowing Apple's record with display technologies, this is probably going to look amazing, but again, only on the 12.9 inch. Okay, so yeah, the, this screen is going to be pretty amazing because it has uh, over 2,500 local dimming zones, and that's more than the Pro Display XDR. And I mean, th uh, this probably mm. this isn't going to beat out the Pro Display on certain things. I think color and stuff maybe will still be limited to a certain point, but because uh, it's P3 wide color right. uh, rather than whatever nonsense the pro display is using but it's still going to be an amazing screen and uh I, viewing content on it's going to be wild but editing is going to be even more important like editing a photo with absolute color accuracy sure none of your friends right. are going to be seeing the photo in the same brilliance as you once you publish <laughs> it on facebook but at least you know that by the time you hit publish that you have seen it in its purest form and you're putting it on the web you know without any uh weird artifacts or whatever and uh, that's pretty exciting to me yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, the best experience for watching something on an Apple device, this 12.9 inch iPad Pro with something like, I don't know, AirPods Max with spatial audio. I mean, the entertainment experience is going to be great. Really curious, just to mention it here, how that will compare to the new iMac, which Apple has now stated has spatial audio. They redid the entire speaker and microphone array on the new iMac. I don't, I don't know, spatial audio coming from an iMac speakers sounded a little funny to me, but we have to hear it to judge. Yeah, because spatial audio has a lot to do with the tracking of like your your head, right? And how you're turning your head. So right. I think maybe that just has to, more to do with the Dolby Atmos support because Apple seems to kind of switch the terminology there when they're describing movies and video with spatial audio with Dolby Atmos because Atmos, again, is... Right. It's like you're sitting in a room full of speakers, but you only have two speakers in front of you. They're just simulating that. Right. Versus spatial audio is you're the rather than having a bunch of stationary speakers, the, the speakers are able to move around you as it plays the audio. So right. Apple seems to kind of, uh, I don't think they mean to fool people into thinking that it's better than it is, but I, it, they're very similar technologies. So it's something we'll have to try out for sure. Yeah. So the final feature I want to discuss, they announced something called center stage. And what Apple said is the front facing camera on the iPad Pro is now an ultra wide camera and it will smart zoom in out and pan when you're on something like a FaceTime call and the center stage technology will be available to third parties. So hopefully apps like Zoom, Google Meet, Skype, apps like that can also take advantage of center stage. And so if you move around in the frame or move out of the frame of your iPad Pro's FaceTime camera, that it will re-crop, re-zoom the image to include you. And if even a second person enters the frame, it will zoom out and try to keep you both in the frame during the call. This sounds really interesting, and I can't wait to look at it actually in action to see how quickly and how accurately it can perceive people. I'm 
not sure that I've ever had this experience uh, using FaceTime. I don't know what it is with Apple presentations, but it's it's like you're watching a 4K movie through the FaceTime camera, and it, I just never have that experience. I know these selfie cameras and stuff are getting way better, especially on the iPads, but whenever I make a FaceTime call, everything just looks like mush. <laughs> and I, I know it's, it has I know it has to do with Wi-Fi connections, but even when I've had gigabit Wi-Fi, I I think both parties have to have absolutely perfect connections, probably even wired connections, and you just can't move at all. And maybe your right. image will look absolutely crystal clear perfect because these presentations always blow my mind like, wow, look at that. That's crystal clear picture. It's following them around. It's really <laughs> nice, but right. I, I will never achieve that. I, I don't have a lab to test this in to try it out. <laughs> So the new iPads, they go on sale April 30th, a week from now, if you're listening to the show when it comes out, and they're saying it'll be available the second half of May. So no promise of order April 30th, and then you'll have it in hand May 7th. They say the second half of May. So curious how long that lead time is going to be. We've heard about lots of supply chain shortages with chips and all that. So again, that's probably making that lead time unknowable to a certain extent. So pricing for these new iPad Pros, the 11-inch starts at $799, the 12.9-inch starts at $1099. The 11-inch seems to be the same price as last year. The 12.9 is a $100 increase. That XDR display most likely having to do with that. So if you start there, you get 128 gigabytes on either of those models. But if you spec this thing out, let's say you're someone named Wes or Steven, and you're going to pre-order this thing on April 30th. And you get the 12.9 inch display, space gray or silver, no cost difference there. You get two terabytes, which to be clear, the two terabytes is like a $1,100 markup. So 128 gigabytes on the 12.9 inch is $1099. The one terabyte is $1799. So that's a $700 jump. And the two terabytes is an $1,100 jump when you get that much storage. So if you get the two terabytes, and maybe you want to add cellular, which is now a $200 addition. That brings the 12.9 inch iPad Pro cost to $23.99, not including Apple Care, which is $150 more or any accessories. This is not a cheap iPad, Wes. No, and I mean, you can pretty much, you're going to shoot over $3,000 after taxes if you buy everything. Yeah. Because you get the uh, the Magic Keyboard. And we didn't mention the white Magic Keyboard. Uh, I, I don't recommend anyone buy that unless right. you're Johnny Ive in a solid white room, <laughs> sterilized, <laughs> you know, wash your hands seven times. I did think about that. Like, that's got to show dirt pretty bad. Because I think that's the first time we've seen an iPad smart keyboard or keyboard folio case in white. And I mean, that's got to show some dirt. If you've ever used the regular Magic Keyboard, they age okay, but they do start to show their age after a period of time. Yeah. And I'm sitting here looking at my Magic Keyboard for my iPad Pro, and it's black, and it's still the same. I mean, there's a little bit of wear on the keyboard after its use or whatever, but yeah, it's it's not dirty looking, and uh, that's something I would be afraid of buying a white keyboard for sure. But I wanted to mention though, yeah, like if you buy everything, if you buy the Apple Pencil, the Magic Keyboard, and max out this thing at two terabytes, you're you're going over three thousand dollars, and that's MacBook Pro sixteen inch territory, right? And right. this is even crazy for me who who buys this thing every year. And <laughs> I mean, I use it for work every single day. I don't need two terabytes, so thankfully the 16 gigs of RAM is coming with one terabyte, so I'll be getting the one terabyte option. If you can spec this thing to be more expensive than some MacBook Pro models with their high-end models, Apple really needs to sell us on the software. Right. And um, I've got a small theory, not to run to, we have a whole event to talk about, but just to say yeah. the iPad OS how much has it really changed since it's first became iPad OS in uh in version 13, right? Not much. It's the same home screen, it's the same app switcher side. It's been a few years and especially last year with the widget changes and stuff to iOS, app, iPad OS barely got touched. And I'm just sitting here spitballing that iPad OS 15 might just be a big paradigm shift. Uh we're not going to see Mac OS levels of like window resizing and stuff, but I have a feeling that Apple really needs to sell this thing in the software story 
They know that they're smart people. And if we go to WWDC and we have the same home screen with the same app switcher and it's, it's going to look bad and people are going to be like, why did we just spend $3,000 on this thing? You know, you're not telling us the whole story here. Yeah, I agree. I think we're going to see some big changes at dub dub and I will join you. I'm going to do the one terabyte. Thankfully I don't edit video on my iPad. I do all my podcast work and audio files are still a reasonable size. (laughs) And so I don't need to store a ton of stuff. So I'll go with the one terabyte cellular. I'm almost sold on. I feel like if I'm going to keep this thing for a few years, maybe I want that just in case I want to activate it at some point and saving $200. Once you get to these kind of numbers, it's like, well, just get it. And it turns out some carriers are doing promotions. Uh, Verizon gives you a $200 gift card for the Verizon gift card. I don't know what you would use it for. Right. AT&T is the worst one. They give you $5 a month for yes. 30 months. I don't know why anyone would even care about that. Yeah. And what, what's what's the other one? T-Mobile, they give you a $200 actual card that you can go and spend anywhere. So if you're T-Mobile, you might be a little bit lucky. Yeah. And when it comes to 5G coverage, depending on your location, you know, T-Mobile 5G coverage can be pretty fast. My experience with AT&T is like, meh, you know, you're not going to get ultra wideband. Probably most places you use it. So, you know, Use discretion on that, but April 30th, pre-orders open. You'll have to beat Wes and myself on pre-ordering this thing that morning. We will be refreshing feverishly. I believe at 8 a.m. pre-orders usually start, so I'll let you know when I, when my order goes through, Wes. Yeah, I'll be posting my delivery dates as soon as I have them for sure. This episode is brought to you by Loopback from Rogue Amoeba. Listen, guys, I am so excited that Rogue Amoeba has come on and sponsored this episode. Because I use Rogue Amoeba products every day, and that is not an exaggeration. And one of the coolest pieces of software they have for your Mac is called Loopback. Listen, if you do anything with audio on your Mac, you're going to want to check out Loopback. Let's say, for instance, you're on a Zoom call, and you would love to play audio from something on your Mac. Maybe it's a song from Apple Music, or maybe you want to play the audio from a YouTube video. To get that into a Zoom call where everyone else can hear it, you would need a secondary device or try to hold something up to the microphone. You don't need to do that. Loopback allows you to take the audio input or output from any app on your Mac and your hardware devices and filter it through an output that can go to Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or whatever you'd like. Maybe you want to add sound effects to your podcast as you record so the person you're recording with can hear them too. Loopback is how you do it. Maybe you want to include music in an event that you're live streaming. Loopback gives you the power to do just that with just a few clicks. It's like a high-end mixing board right on your Mac. Loopback creates virtual audio devices that merge audio from multiple applications and input devices into a single source. So for instance, let's say you got a USB microphone, or maybe it's just your AirPods, and you have the Apple Music app. You can tell Loopback, take the audio from my microphone, and whatever I play in Apple Music, and make that a single input device. Then when you open Zoom or whatever other application, you choose that audio input device that Loopback has created as a virtual audio device, and then whatever music you play in Apple Music and whatever you say in your microphone, it all goes to that app. It is incredibly powerful. Fortunately, it's also incredibly easy to use. Loopback has an intuitive wire-based setup. It makes it easy and obvious to understand exactly how your virtual devices work. You can see where audio is coming from and where it's going to. Configure, adjust, experiment, all just by clicking and dragging. Whether you're a podcaster, a live performer, or maybe a streamer, Loopback can help you. And you can also use Loopback with other Rogue Amoeba software like Audio Hijack, which I use literally all the time to supercharge your recordings and all the audio stuff on your Mac. Guys, I cannot recommend highly enough Rogue Amoeba's Loopback. And while you're there, check out Audio Hijack as well. You can get a free trial today by going to macaudio.com slash insider21. macaudio.com slash insider21. And you can download the free trial of Loopback. And then When you're ready to buy, because after 30 seconds you will be, listeners can save 21% off Loopback with the coupon code INSIDER21, all one word. So download the free trial, macaudio.com slash insider21, and use the coupon code INSIDER21 to get 21% off Loopback software. Our thanks to Rogue Amoeba for making incredible audio software and for sponsoring this episode. 
All right. Well, right before the iPad Pro during the event, Apple announced the new iMac. It was long rumored John Prosser was the first one out there with the different color rumor saying that Apple's going to offer the new iMac in multiple colors. And he was correct on that. And as we'll talk about in a moment too, the man predicted AirTag. He had the leak and he did it and he was correct. But with the new iMac, this is now also powered by the M1. A lot of people thought maybe we would see the next version of Apple Silicon chips, maybe the M1X or M2, but that's not the case. The new iMac is powered by the same M1 processor that all the other Apple Silicon Macs are. This one is a 4.5K monitor, so 4.5K, and the screen size has increased from the previous 21.5 inches to 24 inches. Only one size screen right now, which does ask the question, will we see a larger iMac with a more powerful processor? Maybe they call it an iMac Pro, maybe not, but will we see a larger size that is more powerful than what we have here? We're going to see like a 30 inch, maybe 32 inch um, iMac in the future with the M1X, M2, whatever it's going to be processor. This iMac, uh, I think is just a prelude to what Apple's going to do, do next. Now, maybe that bigger one won't have as many colors. It'll just come in space gray and silver as usual. At the very least, seeing these colorful guys out there just gives us a little bit of hope for what's coming down the line. Because the rumor right now is, is uh, we're basically going to see a Pro Display XDRS iMac Pro running a very powerful Apple Silicon chip. And that's very exciting. That is cool. So the new iMac does come in seven different colors, but not all colors are available at all price points. So again, it's got the M1 chip. Depending on the configuration, you get the eight core CPU and seven core or eight core GPU, much like the MacBook Air, you can decide there. We don't have all the configuration options yet. I imagine you'll be able to get 16 gigs of RAM, maybe up to two terabytes of storage. But the colors, the ports, and Touch ID, which has now come to the Magic Keyboard, a wireless Touch ID for the first time, those things are dependent on what configuration you start with. So the base model, the new iMac, is $1,299, $1,299, and you get the seven core GPU, but only two Thunderbolt USB 4 ports, no Magic Keyboard with Touch ID, and no gigabit Ethernet which is built into the power brick, which we'll talk about in a second. And you only get four color options at that lower price point. You get blue, green, pink, and silver, or you know the light non-color color. And you have to jump up to the $1,500 model if you want the additional three color options, which are yellow, orange, and purple. And then on that model and higher, you get two additional USB 3 ports. So that is a total of four USB-C style ports, two Thunderbolts, two USB, and you get Touch ID wirelessly on the Magic Keyboard and the Gigabit Ethernet port on the Power Brick. The ports, Ethernet, and Touch ID for the price difference, I totally get that, but to only have certain colors on the more expensive options seems a little strange to me. Yeah, this is probably a supply chain play or whatever boring story, but I'm, I'm just going to imagine that there's this last dredge of Johnny Ive uh, worshippers that hiding with an Apple demanding that they only make Y IMAX. And they had to finally just make a deal saying, no, only these colors at higher price bottles, make them pay for that color. <laughs> whatever the case may be, it's kind of, it is kind of funny that Apple's saying, no, if you want a purple IMAX, you're spending some real, real money. Yeah. Now, all the accessories, Magic Keyboard and the Magic Mouse or Magic Trackpad, come color matched to the color of your iMac, which is pretty cool. So if you get a yellow iMac, you get yellow accessories as well. If you go with the cheaper model iMac, you can pay a little more for the Magic Keyboard with Touch ID or one with the numeric pad as well. So that's interesting. These keyboards, mice and trackpads, you're basically getting this white keyboard with a little hint of color hidden between the keys or on the sides or the mouse and trackpad being bright white and that's it they are are we no longer getting the space gray options maybe in the future we'll get pro models but also apple why no backlighting are you that afraid of you know losing a few days off of your battery life that we don't actually get any backlighting it's it's crazy to me that they've updated these keyboards and still withheld that feature that is strange and they also updated the magic mouse but still get the charging port on the bottom, which, you know, we're just used to it by now. But it seems like if you're going to redesign all this stuff, maybe take another pass at the Magic Mouse to allow it to charge and be used at the same time. Now, the Gigabit Ethernet port, this is very interesting. The power brick for the new iMac is actually a box that has a braided cable color matched to the iMac 
that magnetically attaches to the iMac for power. And then another cable from the power brick goes to the wall for electricity. But on that power brick is actually an Ethernet port. And that is where the iMac gets the Ethernet connection is on that power brick, which is super interesting. We've not seen something like this aside from USB-C hubs and all that. But for Apple to do a first party thing like that, Neil Hughes at Apple Insider was actually wondering, would they add more ports to that kind of power brick, maybe with more pro machines, maybe an SD card? I feel like maybe not because that power brick is going to be on the floor or behind a desk. And so it's probably only things that you would want to leave connected permanently like Ethernet and power. So that's interesting. And it's also interesting to me that we need a magnetic power connector at the back of the iMac as if Apple is assuming people are moving these around a lot and wants a quick release or quick connect power cable with magnets. I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, they've heard from the ATP guys who uh, frequently carry iMacs to the beach in a suitcase. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I forgot about that. This this is cool. Uh, it, it, I mean, what would you call this? A MagSafe connector, technically? Yeah, basically. We could see more MagSafe show up in future Macs. I, I've seen people talking about that. That's, that's really exciting. But I think it's just funny that Apple's invented the dongle and everyone's losing their minds. It's like, it's it's just it's another it's another <laughs> dongle with a Ethernet port in it. Right. I've seen some jokes online. Uh, people are saying that the little uh, place where the Ethernet plugs in is actually just uh, ETH, uh, Airport Express that they've connected to power. Oh, uh, yeah, very they've good. just got a bunch laying yeah, around, so might as well good. use them for the new iMacs. Exactly. I, I, I think it's a cool idea. Maybe there could be some more things implemented into this little um, kind of hub dock thing. I I wouldn't bet on it. Apple yeah. just gonna make it real nice and simple. Ethernet in, done. Yeah. Now, the headphone jack is moved to the side, which kind of makes sense. It was always kind of weird to reach behind the iMac to try and plug in a pair of headphones. Also, a word on that Touch ID Magic Keyboard. It will not work with an iPad, in case you were wondering. Some people were thinking, you know, you can use Magic Keyboards and pair them with an iPad. Just use the keyboard. But you can't, in fact, use the Touch ID on the new Magic Keyboard to unlock your iPad. So just word of warning on that. And then just also a little piece of news that came out after the event is that Apple Care Plus, you'll be able to extend Apple Care Plus for Macs indefinitely without having to go to that month to month option. If you want to purchase Apple Care Plus extension packages, once your current coverage expires, you'll be able to do that going forward, obviously including these new iMacs. But here's here's my question for you, Wes. I saw this iMac, everybody was very excited. And I think I got a little spoiled at the renders that we had seen passed around by people like John Prosser, where the renders showed the iMac without a chin. And so once they started the new iMac announcement, I almost assumed it would not have a chin. And now seeing what the iMac looks like in quote unquote real life, or at least in these renders, I don't know if I'm crazy about how this thing looks from the front. You know, from the side, obviously it's super thin, looks great. From the back, it's super clean. There's less ports. So, you know, it's a nice, clean look. The magnetic charging port's cool. But as far as from the front, the side that you like sit in front of all day, I'm not sure if I am crazy about this design. There's a few design decisions here that it's a little weird. I believe all of the displays have white bezels around the screen. Yes. And then underneath is the colored chin, which is a slightly different color than the rest of the body. Right. I'm not sure what Apple's doing here. Uh, these du dual tone thing it's it's cool i guess but again if you're going to spend most of your time staring at the screen i feel like the area around the screen is the most important and uh it feels a little bit i don't know like they just kind of gave up halfway and said oh the backs of these are beautiful but uh, who cares about the screen <laughs> yeah, i actually had to keep looking at different pictures because i would see the pictures from the back and i was like okay those are pretty dark rich colors and then i would see the front and be like that's kind of more of a pale pastel color and i almost had to see like what a color is this actual thing but it is in fact that the sides and back are the darker rich color and the front is that pastel lighter shade of the color. And we got pink and orange. Uh, why, why skip over red, Apple? Come on. I, I would have bought a red iMac instantly, uh, even as an iPad user, just to have it in my room. It's fine. Yeah. I, I thought it was funny to mention uh, MKBHD said there's a reason why the headphone jack's on the side of the iMac. It isn't even for usability purposes. The iMac is now 11.5 <laughs> millimeters thick. And the headphone jack needs 14 millimeters in order to fit. So they had to put it in the side. <laughs> it wow. couldn't go anywhere else. That's interesting. And, you know, I think MKBHD actually tweeted out at the announcement that he's not crazy about the design either. He says they're ugly. Yeah. I, I like, again, I like looking at the whole the whole product. But when you're just looking at the display part, it is it is strange. I'm not a fan of the chin, but 
I know why they did it. Obviously, it's to that's where the whole computer is. Everything else is just speaker. It's just they could have made it a tad bit thicker and threw the CPU behind the speakers or in front of it or whatever and and been done. But uh, I guess they just really wanted to achieve the thinnest possible display. Yeah, I guess the one picture of the guy with the yellow one sitting at the desk, that's the coolest looking one. But he also has like his entire ambiance kind of matches that yellow. So you go curious if you stick this in an office or even in a workplace, if you choose a color that kind of doesn't match with everything else around it, I guess it's not a huge deal. But I don't know. You almost have to be cognizant of that now. I like I I really like the shade of green that they chose. It's almost blue, um, which is nice. Yeah. I I would struggle to choose one of these, but luckily I I don't have to. Um, I'm probably going to, if I ever do buy an (laughs) iMac in the future, it's going to be whatever fancy one comes out uh, after this. And it's probably going to be in space gray. So Exactly. So the new iMac, you'll be able to pre-order it April 30th. Again, they're saying second half of May, this thing will be available. So unknown when it will ship, but it starts at $12.99, pre-orders April 30th. This episode is brought to you by Headspace. Listen, you've probably heard the word meditation before, and maybe you even tried to do it, but it didn't work for you. Maybe you felt like you were doing it wrong. But if mental health is part of your self-care plan this year, you owe it to yourself to try Headspace. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy-to-use app and is a beautiful app, might I add. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. Whatever the situation, Headspace really can help you feel better. Do you feel overwhelmed? Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation just for you. Do you need some help falling asleep? Headspace has wind-down sessions their members swear by. And for parents, Headspace even has morning meditations you can do with your kids. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. I'll be honest, when I'm really working and I have a lot of stuff on my task list, I can feel stressed pretty often. And when I use Headspace, especially when I do it regularly, every day or every day that I'm working, it really helps my focus and peace of mind. I also tried a new thing where I did some Headspace sessions with my kids. They have those specially made courses for kids, either on focus or attention, or maybe it's actually anxiety that they're dealing with. Doing those mindfulness exercises with Headspace with my kids actually helped me feel closer to them, and it really helped their stress level too. And if you haven't tried Headspace in a while, they actually have multiple speakers for different courses, and I recommend you try those different voices. That's pretty fun. Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits. 600,000 five-star reviews and over 60 million downloads. Headspace makes it easy for you to build a life-changing meditation practice with mindfulness that works for you on your schedule, anytime, anywhere. You deserve to feel happier. And Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash Apple Insider. That's headspace.com slash Apple Insider for a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. This is the best deal offered right now, so go to headspace.com slash Apple Insider today. Our thanks to Headspace for sponsoring this episode. We got a nice surprise. Before the iMac was announced, we got an Apple TV 4K refresh. Now, the Apple TV box itself, not a ton changed there, unfortunately. We did get a spec bump. It's using the A12 Bionic chip. Kind of wish they would have used like maybe the latest chip in the Apple TV since it's only updated every few years. But it's okay. We got the A12 Bionic. It is now capable of doing HDR at high frame rates. And they've updated the AirPlay spec. So if you capture HDR video on your iPhone 12, that Dolby Vision HDR, that if you AirPlay it to this new Apple TV 4K, it will play at 4K 60 frames per second just via AirPlay. So That's all well and good. We actually did get Thread built into the Apple TV box, so that's nice. But the big story here, the new redesigned Siri remote. So the flat black touch surface based Siri is no more. And now we have a brand new Siri remote with more buttons, actually has a five-way clickable directional pad that you can push down and click, but you can also swipe across, which is pretty cool. And even a jog wheel, reminiscent of the old iPod jog wheel, if you want to scrub through a TV show, very cool. Plus dedicated power buttons and mute buttons to work your TV in addition to the Apple TV box. And the Siri button has moved to the side. So honestly, it's not a super aesthetically pleasing remote, 
but it doesn't matter because it will probably function really well. And that's what matters. Yeah. If you've seen me cynically replying to some people on Twitter, uh, a lot of people were expecting Apple to bring out a soundbar, Apple TV, and all of our wildest dreams accomplished yeah. PlayStation 5 graphics and stuff. And I, I mean, this whole time I've just been leaning on, it's going to be the same box with a new chip, hopefully a U1, which we didn't get. I was hoping for a new, new chip, like you said, but we got the A12, which is two years old. So we've got right. 2019's Apple tv and that's fine i guess but are we going to be getting the a14 in 2024 it's it's just a very strange product line to me and i i don't see either this means one of two things to me either apple doesn't really care because they have the apple tv app everywhere and this really is just an apple arcade kind of like simple game machine or b they have something much bigger coming in the fall or maybe next year yeah it's possible. You know, it's also interesting because they add little innovative features like this color balancing tool, which you'll be able to use your iPhone, hold it up to the Apple TV screen, and the Apple TV will calibrate itself to have the best color possible for your specific TV. So cool feature, pretty interesting. That feature is available on the current Apple TV 4K as well via the new update. Right, very true. You, have to, you need iOS 14.5. I, I just... Also, like it's it's the A12 and the new new the new Siri remote, which is also compatible with the old Apple TV. So all we really got A12 processor. That's it, because all the new software features, other than high frame rate HDR, honestly, I hadn't even realized that HDR wasn't at a full. 60 frames per second i guess it was at 30 before yeah but yeah that's that's it that's the only new thing and i mean that's fine again this there could be a software story at wwdc i doubt it because apple tv never has a software story <laughs> it's it's just a little disappointing the siri remote's fine it's a little bit utilitarian for my taste i i like that they kept the touch yeah. things with the buttons that's great but overall it's just not the product that we wanted i think yeah, you can buy the remote also. Any Apple TV that runs tvOS is compatible with this new Siri remote, and you can buy it separately for $59, which is actually cheaper than the old Siri remote. I think the old one was $79. Right. Now you can get this remote separately. It works with older Apple TVs. Unfortunately, there's no U1 chip. And again, as we're about to talk about AirTag, it's interesting that they didn't put the U1 chip where you could find this remote easily with your iPhone while they just announced the AirTag U1 precision finding and all that, I was really hoping that the Siri remote would have that too. So this this has been going around. Everyone's been very upset. I'm not entirely sure that that means that there's just absolutely no finding capabilities. I, I mean, it, it might because Apple doesn't really sneak in things like that. But um, it's Bluetooth LE. AirTags also use Bluetooth LE. Right. If the remote has access to that, we, there's a chance that you could... St- ask Siri on your phone to find the remote and it might be able to give you a direction. I don't know how well directional things are with Bluetooth. Maybe it's completely unable to give you the direction the signal's coming from. I have no idea, but technically speaking, I think maybe there's something there that can be used, but yeah, absolutely disappointing that there's no U1 chip. Again, probably just due to this whole chip shortage thing anyway. Right. So the Apple TV, like the iMac and iPad Pro, you can order it April 30th. They say again, available second half of May, 32 gigabyte model for $180 and a 64 gigabyte model for $200. You know, pricing wise, I really wish Apple would have done something to hit that under $100 price point for people to get into the Apple TV space. But that's the price. It's it's weird, again, because we didn't get price drops for the other products. I believe they're just going to kill the previous Apple TV like they've done with other products, slowly phase it out, yeah. let other retailers discount it as need be. But yeah, the $200 price point, because I'm going to buy the more expensive one because I do download a lot of Apple Arcade games. That's really the only reason why you need that storage. Um, 32 is just untenable. I feel like you can get two games on the Apple TV at 32 gigs and you're done. I can say from experience, I've actually had to jump into the managed storage setting option on my Apple TV 4K because I got the 32 gigabytes even for the one that my kids use Apple Arcade on and you do have to manage that storage once you get into like multiple games and it's not great. I mean I would pay $200 for a 128 gig Apple TV that would have been nice but again uh, this product feels very much tack on at the end of uh, a thing they don't it's not really a passion project get it out there get people to buy it if they buy it and move on like hopefully we'll see whatever if if ever a passion project from apple tv but hard to say at this point after a few years of same same right all right and then we come to air tag we finally have the official announcement. It is the name that had been leaked. John Prosser with the original render from a long time ago, rumored for so long, AirTag was officially announced. It is exactly what we thought, a location tracker, 
lots of accessories. It uses the U1 chip and Bluetooth LE. You can attach it to key rings and put it in bags or whatever. It uses the Find My app and system. Interestingly, it actually has a user replaceable battery, which was kind of startling for one, for Apple to announce a product with a user replaceable battery. I don't know the last time that has happened except for the magic mice and keyboards back when the AA battery was what it used. But user replaceable, like 2032 style battery that you can get at whatever store. Battery life should last about a year, which is pretty cool. And the feature of precision finding using that U1 chip where you can basically look at your phone and a big arrow on your phone screen will point you in the direction of whatever air tag you're looking for is pretty cool i know i'm going to be picking up a number of these okay steven so i gotta correct you here this is a completely different product from what was rumored the rumor was for air tags this is air tag completely different oh that's right that's right i've been trying to say air tag singular but it i don't know it just doesn't it drives me crazy <laughs> I, I remember the last time this happened was iphone 10 versus iphone x everyone with the x leaked way ahead of oh, time so we yeah. were all used to saying iphone x and then Tim Cook walks out and says iPhone 10 and everyone's like, what right. are you citing? It, anyway, these are cool. I remember uh, once upon a time, people assumed this would recharge maybe via uh, an Apple Watch charger, which was just very odd to even conceptualize. Uh, how often would you re need to recharge it? Right. The the small uh, batteries thing, that's fine. That's great. I think it is weird that Apple, being the company they are, gave us replaceable batteries. But what else are you going to do? I, yeah. it, as this, you know standing on a mountain saying that we're this green company by 2030 it's going to be you know reversing carbon emissions and stuff but also we sell you this thing that you have to give back to us after a year because it's worthless and yeah i don't i don't think that would right. would fly for a lot of people they've done that a few times with other products kind of a uh, little edging that line and people have blown up about it so i'm glad they made the right decision here yeah i mean they could have done like what tile and other companies have done where you basically have to like mail in your tile again and get a new one at a discount but has anyone ever done that have you ever <laughs> No. no, they die and you you lose them in a closet somewhere and that's it. Yeah, and so I'm I'm very glad for this. There's a, there's a ton of accessories for it. Apple has some first party accessories like keychains and loops. Hermes has like let's be honest, ridiculous hundreds of dollar leather accessories for AirTags. They look really cool, way too expensive. <laughs> they look cool. <laughs> way too expensive. But the AirTags themselves, sorry. <clears throat> But AirTag itself is priced really nicely at $29 per AirTag, or you can get a pack of four for $99, which again, looking at other competitors like Tile, who actually made a stink and wants to bring up some antitrust argument because of this location tracker, uh, pretty good pricing for that compared to other location trackers. Again, I'll be picking up a number of them there. Water resistant, again, a year of battery life. You can customize it with emoji and text and different things like that. If your AirTag gets misplaced and maybe someone else has it or somehow you have an AirTag in your possession, accidentally someone dropped it in your bag or whatever, it will actually start pinging or beeping after three days to let you know that you have an AirTag that's not yours in your immediate vicinity. So after three days, it'll start making a noise saying, hey, this isn't your AirTag. And that's part of Apple's privacy initiative with this kind of location tracker. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, these are really clever devices. I mean, already Samsung's announced that they're mimicking some of these features for their new tracking tags or whatever. I, I like the idea of them. I'm going to buy a four pack. I'm going to slap some emoji on these things and see what I can do with them. <laughs> I want to glue it to the back of my cat and, and so I can, you know, use find my to find <laughs> my cat hiding in my closet and stuff just for fun. But <laughs> maybe around its neck. What do you I mean? What do you put? A, you put a collar on a cat, right? Is that a thing you do? Yeah. Uh, my cat has a, a collar with a bell on it right now, so it doesn't sneak up on me. Uh, speaking of accessories for these things, if you go on Amazon right now and search AirTag, it'll try to autocorrect you, so tell it not to. But there are already dozens of AirTag products that you can buy from $5 to $40. Most of them mimic Apple's design. I think like companies like, uh, what's the word, Spigen, Spigen? Yeah. Those guys already have like an official AirTag accessory. I ordered that one because it looks nice for $17. Plenty of stuff out there. I'm waiting because it's going to happen. Pet collar companies and stuff like that are going to make AirTag compatible collars, and you just slip the tag in there, and if 
if you lose your dog, well, you, now you can find them uh, with Apple's right. chip. I, th I think there's going to be a lot of uses here that people just haven't thought of or conceptualized yet, just because no one's going to stick a tile on an animal just because the their tracking system's a little different and has a much smaller base. Whereas right. this is right. everyone with an iPhone will now be able to ping that chip. Any even if you have an Android phone, you can tap it and get information. Now, my question is: is how do you educate people? Right. Because yeah, sure, everyone on the planet has either iPhone or Android, but if you pick up this air tag how are they going to know that they can tap their phone to it and find a phone number it's it's just yeah. another one of those things that apple has to figure out a, a good way to get the word out there maybe there will be a big social thing maybe not but it, it is an interesting product overall right. I'm, I'm i'm excited to just play around with it for sure now these you can actually pre-order right now as you listen to this podcast the pre-orders opened at 8 a.m eastern april 23rd friday and they will be available next friday april 30th so of all the products announced at the spring loaded event this one is available now i wanted to put this image in our notes because it's hilarious uh when i was spelunking <laughs> when i was spelunking uh amazon for air tags one of the air tag products had this image embedded in it i have no idea why <laughs> but we'll have to in include it somewhere and i don't know but um just so it's a it's a regular orange band that goes around the air tag fine uh, that's that's fine but then in the background it's a woman holding a cell phone looking side-eyeing this child <laughs> this is strange it's such a strange advertisement it says remote listening follow anytime what does that mean it's not for the air tag it's it's such a Ugh. anyway amazon is such an odd marketplace super weird oh yes I'll, I'll include that in the show notes you can uh, enjoy that this episode is brought to you by masterclass with masterclass you can learn from the world's best minds anytime anywhere and at your own pace you can learn scientific thinking and communication from neil degrasse tyson the art of storytelling from neil gaiman learn cooking from gordon ramsay and even directing from james cameron with over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, the thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I love taking masterclass courses, and I've done several of them. One of my favorites is music, scoring, and composition for film with Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer has done so many of the scores you've probably heard in some of the biggest blockbuster movies. And what I love is you can see inside his studio, you see the equipment he's using. He's talking about storytelling and how themes and music can relate to specific characters in the movie. It's just awesome to learn things like that from the people who are doing it in the business. The cinematography and video quality is incredible. They just look and sound great, and lessons are only about 10 to 15 minutes. You could do a lesson on your lunch break, or maybe you started watching one on your phone, and one of my favorite features is you can flip it into audio-only mode and then listen to it like it's a podcast sitting in your car. You can also watch on any device you choose. You can watch on your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac. You can use the web browser or their app on Apple TV. And in addition to the video lessons, Masterclass provides you with downloadable lesson recaps and supplemental materials so you can keep learning even when you're done with the course. Some of the best use cases for that are the cooking classes where you can get downloadable guides that are basically a high-end cookbook that you download from Masterclass. I highly recommend you check it out, get unlimited access to every Masterclass, and as an Apple Insider listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash Apple Insider. That's masterclass.com slash Apple Insider for 15% off Masterclass. Our thanks to Masterclass for sponsoring this episode. Before we get to the Apple Podcast thing, let me just mention very briefly, it did come out that iOS 14.5 will publicly be released next week, most likely Tuesday or Wednesday, April 27th or 28th. So it will be publicly available, mask unlock, all the privacy app stuff. Apps have to opt into the ask not to track thing. So that will be coming out next week. And then Apple Card was actually the very first announcement that Tim Cook talked about. He announced Apple Card Family, where multiple people can merge their Apple cards and even their credit lines into one account. And kids 13 and over can be added to the Apple Card Family if they're in your iCloud family as well. That's pretty interesting. And also, he talked about how everyone in the family will get credit score type credit all using the same Apple Card account. I'm not sure how that all works, but interesting that you can now give kids, teenagers, Apple Cards with spending limits, Tim Cook specified. So that's pretty cool. We'll put a link in show notes to that. All right, and now for the big one. I, I've been thinking about this a lot ever since the event. The second announcement in the entire Spring Loaded event was that Apple is now bringing podcast subscriptions and giving creators the ability 
to create subscriptions with bonus or exclusive content where listeners of podcasts can sign up through Apple, through the Apple Podcast app, and can pay for those subscriptions. You know, it, when it was kind of leaked before the event, the idea was, is this going to be Apple selling exclusive podcasts, like Apple original podcasts, and you add it to the Apple One bundle? But no, this is for creators and companies to have those exclusive feeds. And to be clear, this is the Patreon thing. This is what other websites will do on their own, where listeners pay money and get an ad-free episode or some kind of bonus content. We, ironically, literally just launched a Patreon last episode, patreon.com slash Apple Insider, which will probably stick around for a few reasons that we'll talk about in a moment. But more details have come out about this Apple Podcast subscription service. First of all, like the developer account that you have to have in order to submit an app to the App Store, there's an annual fee. The developer one is $99. This one is only $19.99. So you do have to pay $20 a year to be able to offer podcast subscriptions through Apple. Whatever you charge and people pay you, Apple does get a 30% cut of that income. So this is a similar model to the App Store. And I say similar because Apple just changed the App Store model where if you make less than a million dollars a year, the cut is 15% for Apple developers. I really wish they would have done that for the Apple podcast world, especially when the amount of money traveling through the podcast space is probably much less than the app space. 30% cut, Apple's going to take the first year of any subscription, and then it will drop to 15% transaction fee. Basically, they will take that from your buyers of your exclusive content the second year and later. But once you get into the fine print of this podcast subscription service, there's some interesting things in the terms and conditions. One, Apple owns the relationship with the customers. So like the App Store, customers are buying the app from Apple. And if some refund or something like that is requested, like they are now having to deal with Apple, not you really, the podcast maker. Apple owns the relationship. If you choose to host your exclusive content with Apple, and this is the first time this is available, the entire history of podcasting, you had to host your audio files and your feed elsewhere. And Apple just said, you can submit it to our directory and we will list your podcasts in our directory. Now you can actually host your podcast with Apple as a first party host. And so you send your audio file to Apple. They handle the feed for the exclusive content or whatever podcast. And when you do that, Apple does reserve the right to add DRM protection to your audio files, and they also reserve the right to add transcripts for your podcast files. This is kind of in the fine print, and I'll put a link to this website. Nathan Gathright, he actually really went in and read everything in the terms and conditions. So some of the things I mentioned, like DRM, first-party hosting, if you're going to upload your audio file directly to Apple, it has to be a WAV or FLAC file. You can't upload an MP3, which is what many, many podcasting people use as their audio file. You're granting the right for Apple to use your podcast content to train machine learning. And the, this agreement covers Apple Podcasts everywhere, including on Android. And what is interesting here is, and I said this in our Roundup article on Apple Insider. Apple has really pioneered podcasts for a long time. In 2005, Apple launched podcasts as a free thing. They housed the directory. They let creators make podcasts however they're going to do it. And they listed them. And that's how it's been literally for the past 15 to 16 years. This is the first move Apple has made to create a closed podcast content system. Meaning. If you do exclusive podcast content through Apple using this new podcast subscription service, it will only be listenable in the Apple Podcasts app. You will not be able to use Overcast or Pocket Cast or Castro, nor at the moment could you even listen on an Android phone. At the moment, Apple Podcasts is not an app available on Android. Apple Music is there, other Apple apps are there, but there's no Apple Podcasts app. I believe we'll probably see that soon. But this is the first time Apple has made a move to close this ecosystem a little bit rather than leaving it wide open like they always have been. And I have some mixed feelings about it. Wes, what were you feeling thinking about this? Well, the 30% thing, I'm not a big fan of. I, at first, I was going to come in here and argue, well, if they hosted the files, I would argue 30% is fine, but apparently they do. I, I, explain it to me like I'm five. I, if me walks up to Apple and says, okay, I have a brand new podcast that I just recorded, it, I, is there a process I, of 
I give Apple money, give them my podcast, they host it and they pop it on Apple podcast. That's a totally internal loop now. Like that can happen. Yes. And you can create a new show now. Apple podcast connect. It was kind of down for most of yesterday, but now they've redesigned it. And when you want to create a new show, there's an option to create a new show. And if you want to, you can just record your audio file and do the rest directly through Apple. Give them your audio file, do the Apple podcast information, the title, the descriptions, do the episode information. You could do it all inside Apple and basically have an Apple hosted podcast, or you can still have the option to do like what we do. We host our podcast with Fireside and you can do all your podcast work in there, upload your file there, do your feed and description stuff there, and then give that RSS feed to Apple if you want to. It is that way with a public podcast if you just want a free open podcast. And it's actually the same process if you want paid exclusive content. So let's just be real. We at Apple Insider, we literally just launched a Patreon with ad-free feed. Patreon.com slash Apple Insider. We're probably going to keep it going for a while because again, you cannot use exclusive content in Apple Podcasts in other podcast apps. And we have a large percentage of people that listen in third-party apps. When we set up that same deal, because we're most likely going to be offering it in the Apple Podcasts ecosystem as well, I would either upload that ad-free audio file directly to Apple for Apple to create that private podcast available just by uh, someone paying for it. Users can also check a box and say, this is just a public podcast. But we will do a paid podcast for that ad-free deal. And again, I can give that audio file to Apple. Or if I wanted to, I could create some secret podcast feed somewhere. I can make a private podcast feed in Fireside. I could just have a server somewhere and not publish it publicly, but give that XML feed to Apple. And Apple won't host my audio files, but they'll use that XML feed as the exclusive content feed. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, this this is really cool and sad in the same way. Again, like it, we're cutting off the rest of the podcast apps. This makes me think that very soon I might have to abandon Overcast just because something I want is going to be on Apple Podcasts and nowhere else. And I'm not going to manage multiple podcast apps. Right. The thir- again, the 30% cut seems extreme, but for someone who's aspiring to be a podcaster and just has their audio file in hand, I think they're going to just shoot right through that and be just fine for existing podcast companies or people like real AFM or ATP. Yeah. They're going to look at that and think I can probably do better on my own using Stripe and whatever uh, management services to receive payments and go that route. Sure. Having it all in one spot makes sense. Uh, This is a direct competitive play with what Facebook just announced. um, Who's also trying to uh, host and record and do the whole man audio management within the Facebook app, which is terrifying. Please don't go to Facebook. Don't do it. As far as things go, (laughs) I'm excited by the prospect that this provides because all I need now is transporter on iPad and I could record and upload podcasts to Apple all on my iPad. That would be really awesome. Honestly. Um, again, very soon might hear some changes to how iPad OS handles audio intents. That's very exciting, but that'll probably never <laughs> happen. So <laughs> for sure. So I agree that for someone just starting out, it has been confusing to start a podcast. Like this is why services like anchor had been so popular because they're like, you can host your podcast for free. We'll do all the work for you. Just record in our app. Give us your text for your episode title and descriptions, and we will make you a podcast. I do like that Apple is now offering that ability to people. I mean, for $20 a year, any other service where you're going to host your podcast, it's going to cost you more than that. So cost-wise, if someone wants to have a podcast, an Apple podcast, this is really good for those creators. And I would even say I would trust Apple with my podcast stuff before some of the other companies. Cause like, I think even Anchor has been bought by Spotify. If you were using Anchor before, you know, be wary, your podcast might also be exclusive to the Spotify app pretty soon. So looking at our metrics for Apple Insider, I'm looking at the Apple Insider podcast. 75% of our listeners use the Apple Podcasts app to listen to this show. If we do exclusive content, through the Apple Podcasts app, it'll already be available to three quarters of our listeners. So for us, again, it helps that we are an Apple-centric podcast as far as what user agents people use. It would be probably very beneficial for us to offer this. Also, 
in something like Patreon, there is a barrier to entry where if someone wanted to support the Apple Insider podcast right now, they would have to create a Patreon account. They would have to use Apple Pay or whatever credit card to sign up over there. And you are managing a different account. Now, doing it directly in the Apple Podcasts app, it does make it a little easier. Someone already listening to the Apple Insider podcast will see a button that says, get this show ad free for however much a month. They tap the one button, approve the purchase like they would buying an app or buying a song. They already have a credit card on file with Apple for their Apple ID. And boom, they now have that bonus content feed right there in their podcast app. So it does make for an easier system for onboarding and managing those users. But for the other 25% of our listeners, they would have to either switch to the official Apple Podcasts app, or you have to have some kind of system available for them, like Patreon, or like the guys at ATP and Relay FM. They have their own proprietary systems, which is not cheap to implement or easy to do, but they do it. And you know, obviously that's probably the best because you get the lowest conversion rates. But this is also more expensive than Patreon and other services. Like Patreon, you can get it down to like five to seven percent of they take the revenue. And this is obviously three times or more more than that. So it is a monetary question, especially if you do podcasts for like a living. 30% is now a big price to pay as opposed to what you might have done on those other platforms. And you have to weigh it early on. If you're planning on turning this into a career, let's say you're Joe Schmo just starting a podcast, you bring all of your audience to Apple Podcast and use their service to get to do everything. And then later think, oh no, Apple's taking all of my money. I need, I'm getting too big for this. I need to move out. What do you do? I mean, are you, yeah. I mean, obviously you can probably transition to the XML format and or move your, move your stuff over. But I, I just think it becomes a, problem uh later on down the road for a lot of these creators coming in early and just uh choosing apple so that that might be another risk yeah yeah and so overall i have mixed feelings i don't know how else to say it it's a little weird to see apple play the we are open for 15 years in this area of our business namely podcast which isn't really a business it was just a free thing they did and the directory was a huge benefit to podcasters to make the move of hey you can do exclusive content directly in our app but it's going to be a locked down system. You know, it's also a services revenue play. Apple is trying to more and more get services revenue from different streams. And this would be a big one. Again, 30% of a bunch of podcast revenue feeds is a good chunk of money. I was going to say, I think I'm okay with this, if only because they had to make a play in this space. They had to do something. And out of everything they could have done, this is fine. Like they didn't close up Apple Podcasts. They didn't introduce a monthly fee for some uh, exclusive Podcast Plus thing that no one's probably going to ever listen to. They're keeping it kind of open, kind of closed. They're they're towing that line, but they're at least competing in the space now, whereas they just weren't doing anything before and they had to do something. So I think I'm, I'm okay with this. Yeah. And it remains to be seen, you know, our Patreon, we've, we've had some supporters and we appreciate everyone who has supported it now on patreon.com. Not a huge response right away. And maybe it's just because you love hearing about our sponsors and they're amazing, which I totally get it. But I would be curious the conversion rate with the ease of signing up for exclusive content in the Apple Podcasts app with what will probably be one tap plus approving the purchase and then boom, it's in the app. I mean, that barrier to entry might encourage a lot more people to pay for exclusive content, which would be good for podcast creators. And the only other negative might be if Apple were ever to choose to remove the podcast directory API from third parties. Because right now, apps like Overcast and Pocket Cast actually use the Apple Podcast directory to power their apps. And if Apple were ever to shut that down because it wants to make its content even more exclusive, while there are some third parties like the Podcast Index and other people trying to make podcast directories that are open and free, it would affect a lot of the podcast industry and third party apps. And that would be unfortunate. But Apple does not say they are doing that now and has doesn't seem to have any plans to do that. So that's good. Well, I know we went a little long this week, but I wanted to cover all the stuff that happened at the Spring Loaded event and the new Apple Podcast subscription service for sure. Wanted to give a few shout out to listeners who listen around the world. Jeff sent me an email. He listens from Switzerland, which is amazing. Stuart listens from Australia. That's pretty cool. And then Matthias listens all the way from Argentina. So shout out to you guys. Thank you for listening. 
I would love to hear what you all think. Are you going to be getting some AirTags? I don't know how to pronounce it anymore. Are you looking at that new iPad Pro or iMac or Apple TV? I'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at Wes and myself. Our Twitter handles are in the show notes. You can shoot me an email. If you have a podcast that you host and you'd like to have an Apple Insider staffer as a guest, we'd love to hear from you. Those instructions are in the show notes as well. If you'd like to support the show, we have a Patreon account at patreon.com slash Apple Insider. Sign up there and you will get an RSS feed of the show with no ads. It's totally sponsor free and you get the show a little early as well, plus some other bonus content. So check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Apple Insider. And check out our HomeKit Insider Show that comes out every Monday. We're going to be talking about stuff from the event, of course. And we talk about other smart home and HomeKit stuff. And check out Apple Insider Daily, our daily podcast with the top Apple headlines in just a few minutes. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.